this meeting is being recorded. I said, okay, even though I hate looking at myself on recording. <laughs> I'm much better at radio. <laughs> You're All right. What are you going to say, Chris? I so said, you're good. Of course you look good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Speaking of which, I don't know if any of y'all remember me from way back when I used to do Mid-South Gardens with Plato Tuliatis. I just found all those old tapes from uh, WREG over there. Um, no, not WREG. Which one was it? Anyway, I'm going to get them converted to digital and see how I looked 20 years ago and get to hear Plato's voice again. I hope some of y'all got to meet Plato, who was one of the most brilliant men I ever met and a huge influence on me. Um, oh, I didn't say from the beginning yet. All right, we're going to go into the top as of now. I uh, want to mention that I did teach landscape design down at Mississippi State, and it was a course specifically designed for non-landscape design architects. But I, I co-taught it with a landscape architect who's still a good friend. I learned a lot from her. I learned a lot about um, the fact that landscape design isn't really about plants. Um, it can be plants. That's why, they, why I caught the course that I taught about plants is called plant materials because it's just one of the materials that you're going to use in your landscape design. But a good definition for landscape design, and we're going to talk about this, touch on this off and on throughout the whole program tonight, is it is designing outdoor space for user needs. Now I'm going to assume this is um, for your residential landscape. You might think about it's going to be different if it's for your business or something, and we'll, we'll hit that a little bit harder, but we're gonna mention that we are designing space that's gonna make your life happier, healthier, uh, more convenient, uh, and more pleasurable. And that's that's what we're gonna do tonight. Not so much about what to plant where, where we're gonna cover that when we get into the woodies and the herbaceous and such. All right, so that's who I am. Unfortunately, I've been around so long, you Google up Carol Reese UT, you can find a way to get in touch with me. Um, we do have a UT Gardens Jackson Facebook page for those of you who don't know. And um, our, we have display gardens here and I hope you will make use of those both in our Facebook page because we're always posting things that are either looking good right now or we have live now ever since uh, COVID has been here. We've been doing live from UT Gardens every Tuesday morning, uh, most every Tuesday morning. Sometimes we have reasons that we don't. And uh, we do walk around the garden and we talk about the plants and, and give tips and that kind of thing. So it's open to you any day, any daylight hour, seven days a week. Um, it's your display garden because it want you to come over and look at plants that are gonna do well in West Tennessee. So we killed a lot of plants for you. We are you know, promoting that we, there's a huge range of palette of plants that you could and should be using. And also we kind of show you how to put them together for fun, you know, good contrast. And uh, I'll give credit to Jason Reeves, who has been our garden horticulturist here. He's our research horticulturist, and he is a splendid plantsman and designer. So please drop by. Even this time of year, you would not believe how beautiful the conifers were out there today. Um, the red berries on the, on, the, on the deciduous hollies and such. So anytime you got time and you're in Jackson, honestly, you can see a ton just by driving through the parking lot. So remember, it's your public garden. Come see us. You'll find directions if you Google up any of that information and, and let's move on. All right, a, a landscape design is not a foundation planning. I would see ads sometimes in gardening magazines that send us a picture of your house and we'll design your landscape. No, nope. they might be able to design your foundation planning, which some houses don't really should not have. We'll talk about that in greater depth. Um, it's not about pretty plants, so they may accomplish some of your goals we're going to talk about how we may use them to accomplish those goals, but that's not really what it's about. It's defining outdoor space. It's a solution to make your life easier, more comfortable, better parking, better ways to get around, and plants are just one of those materials. So let's talk about who the users are, right? Landscape architects are designing this particular space for the users that want to come to this baseball game. So they got to design a space where people can get parked, get into the building safely, egress and access the places that they need to do. Um, so that's a whole different set of, of users and a very complex that requires, you know, drainage and, and legal and safety specifications. So landscape architects can do all that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna assume for tonight's class 
you and I are just talking about doing something in our own landscape for our own pleasure and to meet our own design object, uh, objectives. Let me mention real quick, if you want to do some landscape design at your own personal business, then it may be about being very visible and attention getting from the street, which may not be your objective with your home, and also about safety for people to get in and out of the parking lot. So again, objectives um, can change even in, within your own life here. Uh -oh. Why won't you move? Here we go. So let's talk about that. A landscape architect, as I mentioned, can do a whole lot of very specific things, including researching the history of your site. You know, what, what was it in the past? And do you want to recall some of that, how it was used? Uh, they, they do a lot of, of uh, research on it and these very specific design things that are a lot about doing the actual math, the heavy stuff that means everything's going to drain just right and that water is not going to go places it shouldn't. Um, landscape contractors, that is a degree that can be um, gotten in, in schools, and it's about in installation. So they'll take the landscape architect's plan and actually install it so they know how to do all the actual mechanicals that make it work. Mechanics, I should say, excuse me, ex-English major uh, that really hit my ear wrong. There are some people who advertise themselves as garden designers, and often they're quite good, and often they're better plantsmen then uh, landscape architects are not always great plantsmen, I'll tell you. And a lot of them are honest and know that. I've had landscape architects in Northern states call me and say, I'm trying to design, you know, a, a landscape that can be around the Taco Bells all through your region. Um, here's what I need, a plant that will do this. What would you recommend? And I could tell them that, or they could hire a local designer. So garden designers can be quite good and sometimes even better with plant material selections. Landscapers, we're really kind of mean sometimes we call them, sometimes we call them landscapers. And these are usually the guys that are kind of, you know, mow, blow and go. They may be taking care of your turf grass. They may be pruning your shrubbery, often horribly, often crimes against shrubbery. Um, and just because they have a sign on their truck does not mean that they know what they're doing. So be very careful with that. I always like to have somebody, if you're gonna think about hiring this out, be sure you have a portfolio or get references. And it isn't just about how good their work is, now how reliable and how safe did the people feel? You don't want maybe, you know, the wrong people gawking at your teenage daughter if she's outside sunbathing. Uh, so think about, you know, interviewing them on, on more than one level. So let's remember that a landscape should be fluid, I think. Uh, when I first began studying about landscape design and before I got some, some better education, I, I read all these things that really floored me. Like you do not put a plant in the ground until you have a plan committed to paper and you do not go buy a plant until you know where it's gonna go in your landscape design for a particular design function. And I'm like, really, is that realistic? Um, landscapes don't get to this perfect spot and freeze there. They're gonna change. They need to change, they should change. Um, how sick do you get of a silk flower arrangement, right? You like things to be changing and fluid. That's what's going to happen in nature. Plus your own needs, goals, inspirations are going to change over the years, including your own ability to keep up with the landscape. So be sure you keep that in mind all the time that you're not going to do something um, that you expect to get to a certain spot and freeze. It, it, it can't and it won't. They're living things. <clears throat> And I like that because that really means, doesn't it, that you can't make a mistake? I mean, you can erase and start over. And yeah, it take, may take a few years to do that. But remember, just like you change your house, you can knock out walls, you can add windows, you can um, add on, you can, you know, change the floor or the colors of the walls. So you can do all that in the landscape too. It's just a little bit slower process. And that makes me feel less fearful of making a mistake. I always felt like in the beginning, like somehow I'm gonna get it wrong and I couldn't decide what to do. So my advice there is do something. Um, if you don't, you might not ever get around to doing it. And I tell you what, you will most times be very glad you did. And you thought, what was I waiting on? And if you don't like it, fix it. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button, y'all. So, Different lifestyles, if I could drop all of you in the same house and yard, and hopefully you'd all design a different landscape for your lifestyle and your family. Your goals for what you need, like if you're more into healthy eating, then you're gonna probably want your own vegetable garden and fresh herbs instead of using so much salt and butter 
heresy there, but yeah, more fresh herbs. <clears throat> I'm getting where I don't want a vegetable garden that I have to, you know, hoe in the ground. So I've gone to all raised beds. So that that was a whole nother part that I needed in my landscape as I as I got older. I know it's surprising that I, I got older, but it, it happened. I'm still not sure. <clears throat> Supposed, uh, suppose the lot next door that was always nicely secluded got purchased by somebody and they built a mag mansion next door, right? So your surroundings change. It wasn't anything except all of a sudden you need to block and get some privacy so people aren't looking right into your backyard. Um, your inspiration, hopefully, we see something like, man, I wanna do that at mine. And maybe you get a little bit more comfortable financially or less comfortable financially. Um, I'm gonna talk about my mother finally <laughs> at the end of her life coming into some money that allowed her to do some things that have impacted my family now for generations. And soon as plants just don't cooperate with your game plan, it's just not the right site for them. It just didn't work out. So, you know, you can change, we can adjust. I know you want low maintenance. You don't have to tell me. Nobody's ever come up to me and said, would you help me design a high maintenance landscape? Because it ain't gonna happen. We all would like to have something that is a minimum of work. So we're gonna talk about ways to minimize that. Um, we can't make it totally no maintenance. And if you want totally no maintenance, then go move into a condo or an apartment because it means you want to have no relationship whatsoever to the nature outside your door. You don't wanna do anything. so. Go ahead and divorce it now. So if you want lower maintenance, I'm gonna tell you right now, a good thing to do is avoid formal plantings because a formal planting is gonna show every mistake, every weed, everything that goes wrong or died or didn't thrive or grew at a different rate. So we, we might think that's kind of fun to look at for just a minute, but think about the maintenance and, and the mayhem here. What if one of those little dome shaped boxwoods were to die? Would you even know what it is, which box would? Because there's so many to replace it. Can you find the right size? So let's just don't even go there. Um, go and let those people who have tons and tons of money and gardeners that can replace things that they keep back in the background. If you want to go enjoy their formal landscapes, but I'm telling you, I design for plant death because plants will die even if you choose the right plant and everything is done perfectly. You don't know when a deer decides that's the one that wants to rub its antlers on, or the neighbor's Great Dane is galloping through your yard and takes it down. Just had one of my dogs take down a grafted uh, weeping persimmon in my own yard. So, I, you know, if it was trying to match something else on a mirror image, I'd be very upset. Oh, so here we have a, a, a great combination. I'm gonna mention this throughout. I like a few elements of formality. I think that lawn is, is a wonderful element of formality, the steps that march up to it. And we'll talk about this more is talk about this pool of lawn and letting your plantings, a little bit of clipped hedge if you want some. But here, if something in there died, we aren't ruined, are we? We can replace, we can decide we don't even like that plant, take it out and go find something new we wanna try. Screens especially, we preach this with diversity. Diversity is good, re good for many, many reasons. We'll hit that harder. But if you will do multi-purpose, then a disease that's specific to one plant is just gonna hop from plant to plant to plant to plant. It'll maybe kill one plant and that's all you'll lose. Not to mention better wildlife appeal. And then the wildlife is gonna help you control any pestiferous insects more interesting throughout the year because you've got different seasons of interest, different textures, different shapes. It's just a lot more fun. Nobody, nope, nope, nope. We see this so often and as an extension agent, you just groan because you know either a disease is gonna start taking them down like ceridium canker has done with so many Leland cypress across the state or if it's just that one plant dies, gets struck by lightning, let's say, just, you know, something totally out of your control. We're not in control. We like to think we are, we are not. If one dies, you got something that says, whole hill, God, this is your tooth, right now. And you're not gonna find that right plant to replace it. So let's don't. Diversity forgives the loss of plants. It allows additions and adjustments. If one plant didn't get a, if it, maybe got scant at the bottom and you wanted it to be thick, you could add some things around it or below it that could help, you know, give you that full look you were hoping for. All that different season. So all these good reasons. Um, it's just better in general for us and for the world uh, if you're attracting them and helping feed that wildlife. And by the way, you can choose plants that are multi-purpose, both good for wildlife and good for screening, for example. 
So all of us are different people, right? I, I wouldn't be caught dead on a motorcycle. Um, I think it's like riding around on the hood of your car at 60, 70 miles per hour, but uh, some people love them and, you know, more power to them. I used to ride a horse like crazy and that, I almost got killed a few times. So I get it. I get it. You want to do outside yoga. You want get kids who want to play basketball. You got a uh, need to do art. You got to, you know, all these things are going to make you want different things from your landscape. And let's say, just going to do a quick look through some of the possibilities of things that might make your life better or happier and more easy. Do you need privacy? I would need privacy if I lived in town. I live out in the country. I always said I found a place to live where there just aren't too many laws. My manners are really too bad for me to live in town. But if I lived in town, the first thing I would do is have to create a perimeter of privacy because I'm, I'm, I'm town. I'm prone to go out and, you know, garden in my nightgown. And even if you're in your shorts, you know, you're bending over out there. I mean, we are gardening in less than attractive clothing. As soon as I just want to leave everything in the yard and go on in the house and get cleaned up and eat supper. And I might not get back to that job for a few days. So I can just leave everything. I'm going to need some privacy. And I like people, but when I've been, you know, out talking to people all day long and I go home, I don't want to talk to anybody. I am a hermit. I would rather be at home with my dogs, although you wouldn't think it because when I get around a bunch of people, I kind of go wild. <clears throat> Veggies and herbs <clears throat> were already, you know, us wanting to grow our own at home, were already on the boom. But man, when COVID hit, it went crazy. And as some of you may have experienced that uh, being hard to find some of your favorite seeds or plants because everybody was being sold out. Uh, one of my local growers here said, that sales increased 50% and they would have increased a whole lot more than that except they couldn't keep production up with demands. So I hope some of that kind of hangs on after the, the pandemic has passed and that we continue to enjoy this. We've got lots of great information. UTHort.com has tons of vegetable information, plant list information. So if you haven't looked up UTHort.com, please do and explore all the uh, helpful information there. Maybe you want a getaway spot. Maybe you just don't like football and you don't want to hear it anymore. Now, I love it. And if you don't recognize down there on the bottom, that is our very own Derek Henry, giving him the, giving the famous stiff arms that he's known for. And I'm so sad we lost. Um, lost in the playoffs the other day, but we did. So can't, can't do it. So, But if you want a place to just get out and get away from everybody, you know, put that in there. Most of us love birds. Gardeners are nurturing people. We want bird habitat out there. We love our bluebirds. We can plant for them. We can design for them. We can put nests for them. How's your parking? Is there enough? Are people going to the door that you wish they didn't? You, you could redesign it so that they are parking out and off the street. This is a wonderful solution, cutting into this bank and pulling people right up to that front door. So remember, these structural things can make a big difference in, in your life. I have dogs. Y'all hear way too much about them through the talk. Um, so ever since I was a child, I picked up the strays and laid under the porch with them in the dust. And now I finally built a house where I can bring home any daggone stray I want to and get it fixed up. And I adopt them out through the good local agencies that make sure they go into good, good homes. Um, so I want a dog-friendly landscape. Somebody said, well, do they ever destroy plants? Sure they do. Um, I can tell you some ways to avoid that, using some screen, for example, to keep them from digging on the ground. Um, but frankly, I'd take happy dog over pretty plants any day, but I have both and, and you can work it out. If you've got dogs and you got kids, then you need long. Don't let anybody make you feel guilty about that. We're going to talk, tackle that a little bit harder further on, um, but they need a lawn to run on and play on and do their business. So design that landscape for your particular needs. I don't have the backyard chicken bug, but thank goodness I have a neighbor, a very good close friend, and a sister that does. So I stay in fresh eggs without having to, to worry about it, but you may want to design that into your landscape. Most of us are gardening for butterflies. I, I kind of hate, hate it <clears throat> because I resent it because butterflies are so popular because they're so pretty. But there's lots of great pollinators out there that are just homely. And of course, I'm kind of kidding because, you know, the butterflies are like the cheerleaders. And if you're gardening for them, the other pollinators are benefiting too. But as, as a girl who never got to be on the homecoming court, you know, kind of resent the fact that they get all the attention. 
Um, if you want to garden for butterflies, then you may want to plant some plants that are going to be eaten, right? That's why we put them out there. We rejoice when we see the caterpillars on them. Instead of running for the bug spray, we run for our butterfly identification book, which if you don't know, there's a really good one specifically for uh, Tennessee by a really great lady named Rita Venable, Rita Venable. And I can send that information to you if you missed it. But Butterfly Book for Tennessee has eggs and caterpillars, host plants, and the butterflies. Um, I like to do some cut flowers. My friend Jason does these kinds of beautiful things. Mine are a little bit more uh, casual, but here's some old heirloom mums of mine and then some knotweed <laughs> from my garden. Uh, so yeah, some cut flowers, you may really be into it. So having a garden for those. Christmas greenery, Jason makes a little bit extra money every Christmas by making wreaths and Christmas swags and uh, selling them. So pond for wildlife, I, I couldn't wait to, grow, to have a pond, but I'd forgotten how noisy they were. I grew up with one in the pasture just next to the yard. Um, and it, it's a racket out there. Wow, I, I love it. I've learned to identify the different frogs by voice. And by the way, there's a very good website for that. It's called Leaps, L-E-A-P-S. It's a Tennessee uh, site and you can learn all the voices. And y'all, I have 11 different species of toads and frogs that frequent my pond, but I wouldn't know it if I hadn't learned their voices because a lot of them I never ever see. You like to grill out and who doesn't? Even if you're not a meat eater, grilled vegetables are yum. So if you wanna design a place that maybe is a little nicer for doing that kind of thing, a little bit more of an outdoor kitchen, maybe you got the big deep pockets and I'm happy for you if you do, that you wanna design a whole outdoor party pavilion you know, with a big screen TV to watch UT football and have a fire and a kitchen out there for them, all the fun stuff that you can just move it to the outdoors. That would have been very handy uh, this year throughout the pandemic, right? To try to get some family together. Now I'm gonna mention my mother did something like that on a much cheaper scale. We're farm people from Mississippi, just outside of Startable. And um, my mother was always good about taking in the older people in my family. We had a couple of little houses on the farm and she would fix those up or she would let pull a trailer up behind them, make sure we kept everybody, you know, throughout their old age and, and took care of them and, and met their needs. And they all left each other a little bit of money, a little bit of money, a little bit of money. And the last one left it to mama. So she came into a little pile there at the end of her, toward the end of her life. And she said, I'm going to build a swimming pool. I was like, where do I swim in pool, people? Well, I'm building one and I'm putting it out in the middle of the horse pasture. I was like, what? It sounded insane, but let me tell you what happened when she did that. Um, here it is, you see she just built a, a nice pool, it's a little L-shaped, and she put a little pavilion on the side, it's nothing but post and a tin shed and a little bit of a kitchen right there, you can see to your left and a little bathroom behind that and changing room. And that, y'all, is where we all gather you know, for the holidays, throughout the summer, it brings their kids or grandkids or visiting cousins to go swim. And so it has become this gathering place that has made memories now. And this is now the third generation. My mother's long gone. But what she did was conjured up this place in the middle of a horse pasture by drawing it out on a piece of paper and getting it built. And now look at what it has done. Every 4th of July that we can, we didn't this year, we get together, we eat, we cook, and then we shoot fireworks off out there over the pond, you know, once it gets dark. So my family now, probably 60, 70 people, are think of 4th of July as being in Sesums and shooting fireworks over the pond and singing patriotic songs. And thank you, Mama. You didn't listen to me, just like I never listened to you. And look what you did for generations of our family. Yes, I have a brother who wears his cowboy hat in the swimming pool. What's it to you? I think he looks pretty good for 72 year old, which is when I took this picture, he's 76 now. All right, so some of these structural things that are really gonna make the big impact on your landscape, we, we kind of need to try to think about imposing those first. You know, what do you need? What's, what are the functions you expect? How do you plan to move around your landscape? And so we, we should do those first and, and then add the plants because of course, during construction, a lot of times you're gonna damage plants. It's not always possible. You're trying to save some plants. You need to be careful and protect them during construction or you may just have to get rid of them or move them. And that's, that is 
uh, possible. Moving plants of any size, really, with if you got enough money and and a uh, back to move them, can happen. People can move big trees if they're willing to spend forty, fifty thousand dollars a pop. For me, for me, you know, it might be a few shrubs I can dig and move during the dormant season. But basically, think about your structural needs and don't let existing plants or existing structure impede your wishes. You know, you can take it out. I mean, concrete yields to jackhammers, right? So don't let those dictate to you what you can and cannot do. It was very liberating when I built my house, which was 2011, um, to have a neighbor friend came over and flew a drone over the house and the property. And it sort of freed me up about what I wanted to do all around the house. Instead of looking out and seeing things that kind of visually obstructed me, that all of a sudden I could see kind of the way my landscape needed to flow. So you might want to think about that. All right, so the structural options, different kinds, we're gonna show some later on or how to do them. But y'all, what can't you find these days on YouTube or books or search engines or Pinterest, goodness gracious. So all the how to's are out there for you and just figure it out from there. And if you don't feel capable of it, hire somebody who is. All right, so you may not have the deep pockets to do something gorgeous like this, I don't, but it doesn't have to be that you need something like this to make memories. It could be that you just make a little outdoor space that's got shower curtains and a flea market finds and you and your friends and neighbors and family gather out there for events. So it's not necessarily, I always tell people, take the idea and scale it down to your budget, you know? A lot of things I see I can't afford, but I can figure out a way to do it on my budget. So why are these people doing this, right? I'm gonna go back every now and then show the typical landscape. We're like, huh, why in the world? What, what purpose does this, how does this enhance these people's lifestyle? I tell you, not only does it not enhance it, it sentences them to a lifetime of pruning. So we're gonna question these foundation plantings we see everywhere over and over and over, foundation planning, foundation planning. This is a little better, but still, send us to a lifetime of pruning or it's gonna swallow the windows because shrubs always get bigger than the tag said they would. Those uh, uh, ones on the corner are gonna get too tall for the all imported gutters. Uh, I would leave the Japanese maple and limit up and over the windows because it helps keep hot sunlight from coming in the windows and will reduce your uh, cooling bills. In fact, awnings, remember, before air conditioning were designed to keep sunlight from entering the house. You can use small trees for that close to the house. And um, also porches were originally meant to do that. That's the Greeks invented porches to keep hot sunlight from entering and heating up the home. So think about that. But I'd move those away. I would, that, those rest the foundation. Plant. This house, look how low those windows are. This, this house does not need a foundation planting. I would leave some small end up trees, some ground covers, maybe some color. Uh, but everything else, I'm going to move out to the perimeter. Because here's what happens, right? You end up having to prune, 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 or pay somebody else to prune, prune, prune. What if these instead were moved out to the perimeter of the property, let them grow freely and mingle and, pro and provide a beautiful, diverse-looking screen that you can see from the windows, and it provides you privacy so that some woman is not taking a picture of your house to make fun of in a master gardener class, right? So let's think about it. And having just built a home, I do really now recognize the similarities and, and having to finally get, um, get to design a landscape from scratch on a newly built home on a scraped piece of property because I bought some hilly land that had been logged, that's how I was able to get 100 acres very, very cheaply. Um, and then, but to make a place to build a home, we had to do a lot of scraping off all those stumps and cutbacks. And um, so I really had to impose, you know, everything from the ground up onto that, that, that piece of land. So what do you, in my family, it's just me. I have a man friend too but I have a whole lot of dogs. So I designed it all around that. It's whatever your family does, whatever your family wants. So you're gonna define those spaces to meet your needs, just like I did with my rooms in my house. I thought about where I wanted to be when I woke in the morning, how I wanted to move through the house to get my coffee, what I wanted to see out each window. Recognize how all these dreams you have with the site realities, right? 
Some of that may not be possible. So you're gonna have to do some compromise. Although sometimes the site realities can offer opportunities you hadn't considered. Um, and you know, in there, we're talking about climate too. For example, in our part of the world, we wanna to try to think about keeping the house cool. So shade and breeze and all that kind of thing would be an important concept for us up north. It might be about keeping the house warm so that that user would be a northern user for southern users. It would change the hardscape should come first or impose it anyway. And then this sort of thing about those mainstay plants that help you accomplish those goals like shade like screening, like anchoring soil if you have erosion. And then finally, you get around to the decorating. Is it not like building a house, right? You design your spaces, you build your walls, you define them, then you finally get to the, the decorating part later on. So that's what we're thinking about with this landscape. I wanna give, I'm so grateful to have found this man who helped me because I sketched out a house myself. I showed it to an architect and he said, you've really kind of got it. You just need to find a good country builder. I don't want to charge you anything, ma'am. You got it going on. You've already thought about all the things I would have probably thought about when I was drawing up your house too. So Tommy Connor, I fired my first builder. He kept trying to impose his idea. This guy was a third generation country builder. He died on me last year before last. So I'll give him a little credit, but we had a lot of fun. He, he really helped me out on some things that would have been design flaws. And uh, he figured out stuff as we went along. He was he was very happy with my creativity and we, we had a big time. One thing I wanted to do was, my house was all about the outdoors. I mean, that's just who I am. I'm a country girl, I'm tomboy. I wanna to be out, I wanna tromp in and out. And a lot of times when you get up first time in the morning, you still got your house shoes on, your nightgown. When I wanted to go out, I didn't want my feet to touch the ground until I had shoes on, it wouldn't get wet in the dew. So, and I love stepping out from any room. Every room in my house has an outside door, except the guest room. I guess if the house caught on fire, they could go out the window because all my windows are low to the ground as well. <clears throat> but so I can go out on the deck or a porch and down to a patio and then back up to a deck or a porch and then around to the drive area. So that was something I wanted. So that was not about foundation plantings. That was about um, the ability to move around, the mobility of, of my landscape, the way to, to transition. Let's also look at some other things you can see. I've just built the house. I put in a grill right away. And you see out, out there all the bare red soil because of all that scraping we had done. I mentioned that I take in rescue dogs. That is a built-in dog door right there. And by the way, I did a tunnel. They have to go through two doors to get in or out. Because if you have dog doors, you know dogs love to stand halfway in and halfway out and bark and let the cold air in or the hot air in. So I made it possible impossible for them to do that. I did not plan on the fact that sometimes they like to go to sleep in there and that every now and you'll see or hear a bunch of growling in the dog door and have to yell, Rupert, get out of the door. And then so the other dogs can come in and out. But the front porch, right, I can travel all the way around the house and, um, and be on some kind of an outdoor structure. But back to the red soil, I decided I need to spend that last bit of money that I was gonna get all new appliances, which I'd never had in my life. I needed sod instead. Why did I need sod? Did, do I need to go back to that picture of, of the red with all my rescue dogs? I have four cats and me in my boots trobbing around. Can you imagine what my floors look like? I mean, luckily they're red pine that I do, don't try to keep shiny, but still. So I decided I needed sod and I bought zoysia sod because if you've ever stood on really good zoysia sod, you know you aren't touching the earth. It holds you aloft. It's got so much silica in it that you're really held up and above the actual soil. Well, isn't that good then if you're trying to clean dogs' feet before they come back in the house? So I bought what I couldn't afford to do the whole yard, but I did the perimeters before you get up to the dog doors and then some along some important areas. And then I started plugging and now I've just about got solid zoysia coverage. Also because it's very slow growing, I don't have to mow it very often. And eventually gets so dense that it will uh, choke out weeds. I, mean, I don't care if my lawns have a few weeds, that doesn't bother me. Another reason you might decide you want turf grass is this is at my family's home. There's the lake that we shoot the fire back on the right corner that you can't see. We have Easter festivals. Um, we have sack races and egg you know, hunts and all Easter egg hunts, all that stuff that people do outdoors and have a blast. So we need big expanses of lawn. But as you can see, we don't care the fact that there's spring beauty in there and dandelions. Down there, we have St. Augustine, 
once it starts growing and once it gets warm, we start mowing, those spring weeds aren't a problem anyway, and they benefit the pollinators. Um, so we don't, we don't worry about that. We do play grown-up games too, but we're rough. We've had one broken leg, one sprained ankle. I've gotten to the age where now I just provide prizes and blow the whistle. So dogs, let's get back to dogs and, and grass. Look at how good that stuff scratches Hercules' bag, right? So uh, I love my zoysia. I, I'll just go ahead and tell you that I never thought I'd be a turf grass person until I needed some. And now people don't believe that's what I tell them is the lowest maintenance part of my landscape. Because I, all I ever do, because I have a pretty big property, I bought a, a nice zero turn mower. And sitting on that mower and mowing that zoysia, which it only needs maybe every three or four weeks in, in late summer, maybe a little bit more earlier in the summer, is my rest. Uh, the, the hard maintenance is all the weeding, controlling, planting, mulching in my mini borders around the edges of my property. So actually it is low maintenance because I don't care about keeping it to golf course standards. Those of you who are turf people can tell that I should have sharpened my lower, my lawnmower blades, right? Because uh, of ragged cuts on that grass. So don't believe this either. You've, you've probably heard this over and over. I'm so, I get so angry at untruths that get spread like wildfire when good gardening advice moves so slow. But to hear people say that it's not good for wildlife when all of these birds have prospered because of the amount of lawn. Um, thrashers, robins, bluebirds, flickers, phoebes, and crows love lawn. That's where they like to pluck the insects. Um, it is their preferred habitat. The flickers are hunting for ants. They'll put their head down in the ground and eat ant larvae. So that's very helpful. So don't let people tell you that. These birds are adapters. Uh, some birds prefer the woods, some birds prefer the open lawn or the open fields, and some birds, a lot of birds, prefer the edge between those two. So simply provide them with a lot of edge as well as an open expanse of lawn. As you see here, this is ideal bluebird habitat. They will not nest in the woods. They're afraid of snakes dropping in of their nest uh, from the trees. They want to see if anything's approaching on the clear ground around them. So what you want to do is put your bluebird box on the edges around here, out of the lawn a little bit. Don't let any shrubs be around the bottom of your pole. And they need to face that open lawn. And that is ideal bluebird habitat. You want, you want to have exact, because then they're going to hunt their insects also in that shrubbery. Oh, and in that shrubbery, plant a lot of things that will have dried berries on them in the winter, because that is what a bluebird eats during the winter months when the insects are not around, as, as well as a lot of other birds. So do you want turf grass or do you want woodland? I hear this argument a lot. Usually it's somebody loves the turf grass, often the man, I'm not gonna make too categorical a statement there. And the, the woman wants the, the shade and the trees in the garden area. Um, but there's no reason you can't have both, right? Look here, this is Jimmy Williams up in Paris, Tennessee. He's got a fabulous garden, he calls Tennessee Dixter. And you see he's got fabulous lawn and then you enter the woodland garden. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. There are compromises. Now, if you want mostly shade, but you still want a lawn like a peel and open space, here's a great alternative and that is a moss lawn. This is a friend of mine in Nashville, J. Paul Moore. And he gets down on his hands and knees twice a year and weeds his moss lawn. And it's just absolutely stunning. Because if he wanted grass to grow there, he'd have to cut down a lot of trees he would have to make that soil a lot less acid and less compact. Moss loves what grass hates. So if grass hates that spot, don't try to make grass grow where it doesn't want to grow. Go with the moss option. This is beautiful, beautiful stuff. At Garden Zoe Bay, they're a little bit less crisp about their line, but same principle. And this is in Collierville. If you haven't been out there, they are open sometimes to the public, not, not all the time anymore. And they uh, have moss paths and mossy floors all through their woodland landscape. And what they do to prepare, this is new planting beds. They have a lot of them already planted up. They just blow those leaves around the trees and let that break down and form nice earthy organic soil. And then they plant shade adapted plants into those wonderful beds that they've created by simply putting the leaves where they need to be. Cause that's the secret to get moss to grow. You gotta keep the leaves off of it. That's why you find it on those slopes in the woods because the leaves will slide down. You'll find that moss on the bank where it's free of the leaves. So keeping the leaves off is key. 
but you don't have to have moss either. This was in Collierville many years ago. I cannot remember where this house was. And it's nothing but woodland, shade plants, and trees. And this is the front, front yard. So it's really nice space. I remember when I drove over there that I got out and it was just quiet and cool. And all down in the neighborhood, people were running their lawnmowers. These people didn't own a lawnmower. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I admit, I love my lawn, but I thought that sounded pretty cool. All right, let's talk about developing your own sense of style in your garden, right? You may have it in, in your own interior. This is the, the big traditional Southern, you know, kind of formal, not, not me at all. I've got too many dogs to put up with that. This is better. I, I love all the color. I like mixtures of colors and patterns and eclectic, you know, picking up things. That's a more of a, you know, cottage art, artist thing. They are minimalist. I tried to be when I, I built my house. I wanted to clean it with a leaf blower. Um, then the man friend kept showing up with actual furniture. I was like moved in with like a bed, a table, a spoon, and a chair. But uh, can't clean it with a leaf blower anymore. This is kind of like me though. I like the rustic industrial. I call my house rustic industrial. Um, <clears throat> so that is kind of what I ended up, this is my house now. And Tommy, you know, did, I, I've got wood everywhere and no, um, that pasteboard, whatever you call it, that will break if you hit it and get wet if dogs come in and shake on it. So everything's wood. You can put a nail anywhere you want to. And I wanted to view from the kitchen sink and I've got kind of this rustic industrial thing going on. Um, minimalist landscape then, okay? Let's, we talked about some interiors. Let's think about how that same thing could transform to, transform to the outside. Uh, somebody who likes a little order with a little bit of, and some enclosure and privacy. You know, maybe you need a safe, very safe environment if you live maybe in a place where you don't feel like um, it's particularly safe. And maybe you want a, a place that's all about entertaining and have some enclosure where you're not bothering your neighbors. So you can invite people to, and watch the fire, which, you know, is great for those long silences um, and what people call redneck television, you know, just watching the fire. A uh, loose informal cottage look might be your style. You might want a little bit of an oriental influence. My friend Don Williams, rest in peace uh, from uh, Knoxville. Tropicals, yes, you can grow uh, at least two palms in Memphis. I took this picture in Memphis. You can grow needle palm and you can grow Chinese windmill palm. So you could give the illusion you're in Florida out around your pool if you want. Uh, the mean garden, I call this. I love these kinds of plants. They're so sculptural. They look beautiful winter and summer. But also, I want my front gate to look mean, where you can, uh, where you turn off my little rural road, which is a gravel road, and um, my house is out of sight down the driveway and around the curve. So sometimes people wanted to come in and see till I got the gate up, and then they were, actually would have been able to get around the gate on the sides if I hadn't planted mean plants hardy agave, prickly yucca. So that's like, you know, stay out. We call it the mean garden and we collect thorny and spiky things for it all the time. Maybe just like a little whimsical, you like to have fun. You want your garden to be funky and just have a ball out there with trying out different things. So go for it, whatever's your style. Let the site talk to you. You know, the beauty here of this woodland pond, <clears throat> you know, you probably just want to impose very little distraction from that. So just some rustic furniture and a place to sit. <clears throat> My friends, the Bobbits over south of Lexington, they uh, designed this house for that site. You can see it's not about the foundation, it's about the views from those windows upstairs because when they are looking out from up there, this is what they see. So it's, it's a beautiful building, really well designed for that site and the landscape uh, also echoes that. So when I built the house, this is the view of my valley. Uh, I call this the magic hour. The valley on the far side um, catches the late evening light and it makes it glow. There's a creek runs down the center of the valley. And I love to go out and look at this on the magic hour on those rare, uh, these days rarely that we have any sunlight, but in the summer and fall, it's one of my favorite things to do. I always try to be sure, go out there and look at the magic hour. And it was beautiful. It really was. But I let it talk to me for a few years before I decided what I wanted to do. And I did feel like I just wanted a little discipline in there, just a little bit of the hand of man, because I think sometimes you need a little bit of reassurance. Um, and this may sound weird, but if you were lost in the wilderness and you've been walking for days and you were trying to find help and you finally see a fence or a hay bale or a barn, or even a road, you're like, man, man, I'm with my tribe, I'm found. 
I think we'd like to see a little bit of the hand of man uh, makes us a little more comfortable. And it was all about my view, right? I found some hilly land in West Tennessee. I'm in uh, North Henderson County. If you go down I-40 out of Jackson going toward Nashville, there's that little hilly area right there where the Natchez Trace State Park in that little area. That's my topography, that's where I am. So I've never lived anywhere where I had such a great view. So that was part of my, I wanted to be sure I preserved that. As you can tell, the dogs liked it too. I had great sunrises and sunsets that I could see from, so I didn't want to, I had what I call great sky. I didn't want to obscure my great sky. I don't know why I have a thing for contrails. It's something about that straight line through all the random clouds that always kind of attracts me. And here's the moonrise. As Sandy was absolutely tearing up the East Coast, you remember there was a big tidal wave because it was a full moon. I was photographing the valley at moonrise and thinking about how different, how calm it was in my valley compared to what they were going through up there. It was a, a poignant moment. My bedroom windows, I wanted pointed to the east, to the rising sun. I laid out my house with a compass in my hand. I wanted to know how the sun moved through my house, just like you would want to know how the sun moves through your landscapes. You know, do you want to be able to see the rising sun and the setting sun? These are all things you should take into account. I think all those dogs have passed now. Um, and then these windows, let's talk about these windows again, because I knew when I stood at the kitchen sink, I wanted to see the sunset. That's when you're there, you're getting your dinner ready and you're washing up and you want to look out the windows and see something. I didn't want the sun directly in my eyes, so I designed it so that it looks um, more southwest than west. And so it angles across that deck. It gives me some beautiful backlighting of some of the plants on the deck that I planted out in the landscape to back, catch that backlighting. So look at those windows over my kitchen sink. And then I wanted to look out and look at, I knew when I built the house, this is pre-pond, that that little valley was gonna make a perfect pond. And I finally understood why my mother always said, oh, we need to be looking at water and why she built her house so that it looked at a pond. Um, the human psyche wants to see water. Water is life when we go to a park, we go to the water, we walk up to the water's edge, when we go to other planets, we look for water. We really like to see water, it's promise, it's hope, it's life. So eventually I got the pond built. <clears throat> and now this is what you see from my deck, from my kitchen, from the glass doors that open onto my deck in the living area. And, and again, the great sky. So there, look at the windows once again, I'm gonna go grow across the pond and shoot back at the house. And you can see the four little windows over there. Now, and this is also to illustrate something else. I didn't go crazy cleaning up my woods. I, I looked at things through several years and explored and found out that I had a lot of gifts out there. So don't be in a hurry to clean up. Number one, the wildlife needs some wild areas and some thicket areas, but these plants in the foreground are smooth hydrangea. We have a native hydrangea arborescence, it's really common throughout the, uh, Tennessee and West Tennessee. And um, because I opened up the light a little bit building the pond, they really began to flourish. So I get to see those blooming from my kitchen windows over there. Um, and just, you know, I removed a few more plants to be sure I could see them well, but I didn't run in there and clean up all these great plants that were already there for me to enjoy. Here's the view in winter. Um, so just, just a little bit about, you know, thinking about that view. I want to see my hummingbirds. So I hung, hang my hummingbird feeders right outside that kitchen window, found my little tacky Tennessee made out of horseshoes. And there he is sitting on the E in the Tennessee. So whatever makes you happy, you know, it's your view. Put something out there that you enjoy. Now, I, you know, luckily at this point in my life, got to a point where I could buy a piece of property out in a wild part of the country and uh, put in my lawless house, but you don't want that maybe, and that's just not your thing, and I get that. So here's a Memphis landscape that is a beautiful little backyard that has no mow, they don't mow, it's just about steps and meandering around and, and planting and gardening and privacy, and they took advantage of the elevation back there by making this sunken courtyard patio. So this is a lot of times when things that look like challenge can actually be opportunities. So, you know, the site, you, you, you know, some people aren't gonna do what I wanna do, you know, having a, a house in the country where you could bring home all the dogs you wanted isn't everybody's objective, I get that. 
But either way, whatever you're doing, it's more fun than this, isn't it? What are these people doing? What is this about? Why are they doing it? Why does everybody think you're supposed to slam shrubs against the house? And live with this kind of thing and the, the uh, buying a one shrub at a time or they had bad teeth. I don't know what influences this. These people like trains. They don't want anybody to see in the windows. Are they cooking meth in there? I don't think so. I don't think meth people prune or maybe they do when they're jacked up. I'm, I'm not sure. Look at this perfectionist. Oh my gosh, this is over in Brownsville. You know there's a string line involved. Can you imagine what's going to happen if one of those shrubs dies? Oh, 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 what's the wildlife going to do here? What do the people in the house get to see when they look out? You know, I don't understand this kind of thinking, but I also accept the fact that if they love a perfect lawn, if they love perfect symmetry, and they can keep it that way, then more power to it. But I would fret if there was one weed in that lawn, if there was one shrub that died or one limb that got out of whack. I don't want, I don't want all that maintenance. I don't want to worry about it. All right, so how do we get into these foundation planning you know, thoughts. <clears throat> we built a lot of wooden houses with wooden floors. Why? Because we had a lot of trees. You know, Europe, big trees were kind of getting scarce and hard to come by. Here we came over to America and oh my goodness, what a resource. And so wooden houses flew up. If you've ever been to Europe, I got to go a few years ago, luckily on a faculty scholarship, I couldn't afford it. But what I, what I really came away from Europe understanding was the permanence of some of these buildings and these homes that have been passed down through centuries made of stone. Um, American houses, mostly made of wood, are temporary structures. They have a certain lifespan and they're gone because wood doesn't hold up forever. It can hold up a pretty long time, well taken care of, but you certainly didn't want that wood anywhere near that soil. So we put them up on things. We put them up on you know these concrete stanchions or in East Tennessee, it would have been on stone or the house I grew up in down in Mississippi was on brick pillars. So you got them up off the ground to get away from the wetness of the soil and the termites, of course. So then we just got in the habit and we thought we were supposed to. And so we did it no matter what the house was like. Now, I'm not saying that foundation paintings are wrong for all houses, but I want every house judged on its own merit. Obviously, this one needs a foundation painting, I think. You know, it looks like it's going to slide down that hill. Mine wouldn't be in a row, it wouldn't be the same plants. It would have an asymmetrical balance to balance out that garage. I would do a mass planting on the far side and trickle it down over to this side and maybe a small tree limbed up over here. But I think this house needs one. Although this guy, you can tell he doesn't like plants. He didn't, he can't even get the driveway clean enough, can he? <clears throat> oh, please give that house a foundation planting. I hear it crying in the night for a foundation planting. <gasps> Look, they did. Well, it's pretty pitiful, isn't it? Right across the street is Jimmy Williams' house, one of the most spectacular landscapes you'll ever see. I don't know why they can't walk over there and get some inspiration. But remember, some houses don't. They just don't need uh, foundation planting. I think this would be a crime to cover up those beautiful steps and entranceway to that house. I don't want to obscure that. The, the big trees do plenty of softening. The plants in pots do some softening. That doesn't need one. So let's evaluate each house. And it certainly doesn't have to be all about slamming up against the, um, the side of the house and that little bitty space between the sidewalk and the house. It could be moved entirely across. I wouldn't have put that shrub right there under that window. I would have put the taller things across and, and kept everything on that side very low. But Jimmy Williams, I'm going back to his house, his foundation plantings, which I think were important here because his deck, you know, towers so high above the ground and you don't want to see all the structural elements there. But he made them into just places to garden. And by the way, while we're here, let's admire that sidewalk, which he laid, a curved, uh, scrubbed aggregate sidewalk, which is the border for his beds. So that gives him a few minutes to run for help if the Bermuda grass tries to get in his flower beds. You know, I call it Bermuda the Hun. Although truth is Jimmy has fescue, not Bermuda grass, but I think this is brilliant because you walk around on your walks in, in the morning when you get up and you walk around again when you get home from work. So why not have a, have a walkway that doubles as, a, as an edging? The different ways you could do foundation paintings if you want to have some, you know, just not about slamming shrubs right up under in a line. So more creative, different options that have to be any uh, row of shrubs next to the house, maybe one or two that's gonna stay low. Gravel, I'm very fond of gravel in particular settings. 
Um, it can also double as a place for extra place for people to park if you want to get those rocks. You might want to move the plantings away from the house and put them out toward the sidewalk. There's plenty of softening going on here. Um, the hail strip has become a big focus in cities. It's kind of a gift to your neighbors that you put these plants out there that uh, will thrive in that sort of challenging condition and provide some fragrance perhaps as you brush against them, pushing your stroller or walking your dog or getting your exercise. So, you know, that's a, that's a big movement. Remember, if you have this relaxed approach to your foundation planning, you can adjust the plant selections for the side of that house because the north side is not going to get much sun. You need shade loving. East side plants will be different than those plants on the west and south side that are going to have to tolerate a lot of hot sun unless you get some shade on them, of course. But, you, you know, this relaxed approach allows you to pick the right plant for that particular aspect. Now, I'm not telling you never to prune shrubs. I love sometimes a little bit of design intent, a very purposeful, you know, a little bit of prune, keep it neat area. This is Jimmy's yard again, and he loves this little spoke of these very trimmed boxwoods, and he changes out his uh, color from, you know, winter to summer. But look at the background. Look at how much of his landscape is actually quite wild. And we're going to talk about this as we develop, once we start talking about how to think of design and don't let it intim intimidate you, is it's a great thing to think about imposing some strong geometry and you can let the rest of the landscape actually be pretty wild and it looks very disciplined and designed. So we'll, we'll work on that more. See, we're, we're having a lot more fun. So let's, let's talk about that. If you're intimidated by design, because gosh, some plants, I mean, some books do make it ever so complicated. Yeah, some of them have 11 principles, some have seven, blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you read your chapter, my, the chapter I wrote on landscape design, I hope that in there, I made it less difficult. I was worried when I sent that chapter over to my friend that was the landscape architect that taught me about it. Uh, she now lives in Granite, I mean, uh, in, in France. She's English, so very, very formal and proper. And we got to be very good friends, so much so that I had to adopt her dogs when she went back. But um, she read my chapter and I expected her to, you know, be pretty critical, but she she corrected a few things, sent it back, and, and I'm, I'm so happy with it. If you would read it, I think you'll find it uh, very digestible. I, I write like I talk, hopefully. I, I think that's one of the best compliments I've heard is it's easy to get into. All right, so I said I was reading granite. Number, just remember, you can make mistakes. It's not carved in granite. It's not permanent. You can change it if you make a mistake, or you can change it just because you feel like it. It's never going to be perfect, so don't even try. Uh, they're living things and they're going to foil, foil you one way or another. <clears throat> it will always be evolving. Sometimes there are delightful things that happen that you wouldn't have predicted. Sometimes not so much and you may want to edit, you know, or change. So I read somewhere this great quote that made me feel a lot more comfortable. And that was that every great garden has been in the wheelbarrow three times. So I move a lot of plants around. All right. So first of all, let's think about function. If you're starting to think about designing your own landscape, how do you want to live? What do you want out there in your landscape? So let's talk about how we get around. Where do you want the walkways to go where you do things you want to do from parking to your house safely? Uh, do you want some fencing either for privacy or protection or you have kids or pets that you want to keep safe? Uh, have some outdoor living places either just for yourself or if you like to entertain, they might need to be big generous places with plenty of seating, veggie gardens. A lot of us are really into that. And I grew up hating the vegetable garden. Now, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do, you got kid, a place for kids to soccer practice or whatever it is they want to do. All these things have to uh, come into play first, you know, and again, even the already plants there, still think of them as first and don't be afraid to remove some of those things that are there that are obstructing your vision. Let's look at parking just a little bit here. And let's remember, if you watch Downton Abbey, that the carriage is pulled up at the front door and people could get out and go in the front door. And I think this is beautiful. Uh, you know, the portico there that people can pull up under, or portiche, I always get those terms confused, um, is fabulous. And look, Ma, no shrubs around the house. It, it just, it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look naked. It's very handsome. So that's, that's an option. Need to create a little more parking parking, just add it onto the side. Everybody was going and parking out back. 
but instead you made some more parking against the side of your driveway and it leads them to your front door where you wanted them. Oh, sorry, that didn't mean to come. You want some veggie garden function? We're talking function first. Oh yeah, I'm making fun of this. I see this everywhere. I see this all around, like big parking lots at Lowe's, little tiny shrubs that they keep pruned down into lozenges and M&Ms and popsicles. And they have no function whatsoever except to keep the landscape company paid. Yep, money speaks. So you want vegetable garden, do you want to have some raised beds out there that should be thought of where you want those to go, where they could get enough sunlight, of course, is gonna have to play. You gotta place, uh, you gotta cross some water to get to part of your landscape, you know, a beautiful little bridge and maybe the ability to drive across it with a small truck or your lawn tractor. Uh, you need some fencing or protection, a place to keep yourself perhaps safe from the street. It could be fun and handsome. And I love, again, I like the rusted industrial look. Uh, parking that directs people to the front door instead of having them go out back and come in your sewing room. Uh, more parking that directs people to your front door. These are in Nashville. Um, another kind of pull up to the front door. I love crushed gravel. I use crushed gravel a lot in my landscape. <clears throat> it's weird. I have found that's where most of my annuals like to reseed. Not in the good soil, but in the crushed gravel. All right, so let's just kind of run through this and think about, you know, it's about you. You have reasons you may want to hire a pro, and we talked about what that is. <clears throat> so you're thinking about this. You're going to designate those areas that you want to use <clears throat> and uh, adjust that to the actual site. <clears throat> and then when you start getting to the aesthetics of how you want it to look, where do you start there? Some people go out to the street, look back at the house, and maybe those people are very concerned with appearances, and I'm not. I am concerned with me. Perhaps it's selfish, but I start with my most important view from my kitchen sink, and believe it or not, from my bathrooms, because my sister, she did this. I've never had a good idea in my life. I just steal good ideas. She put a window in the bathroom that she added onto an old cabin on the farm um, that I ended up living in when she had too many kids to stay there. And I love sitting on the john and bird watching. And I thought, if I ever build my own house, I'm going to have dead gum windows I can see from the john. And I do. So I live out in private area and I can do that. Or you could plan around it so that it's private. Um, and I, I just think having a, a bathroom in a dark interior of your house, there's a lot of reasons not to do that, really. Um, Anyway, so decide, decide what's your most important view. For me, it was those, but it might be from your patio, it might be from your breakfast nook, whatever it is, it's yours, and you're the artist in charge of that view. If you have anything you like to see, um, you can enhance it, or you can create something you like to see. If you have things you don't like to see, you can screen it out. And we have great new screening publication, by the way, at uthort.com. Remember that you're gonna do a flexible design because it can and should change over time and plan for it to plan for it to change. All right, so let's talk about looking out that window, right? We want that view from the window. I, I did all my windows low in my house. These, these are not my animals or my windows um, so that the animals could see out the windows. Animals love to look out the window and of course we do too. So we talk about the view from my deck and this is what I would see when looking out there. And I wanted to look, I want some kind of formality that kind of frames my view. And so that is what my rebar uh, railings did. And then the lattice works. So I said, why do people do that overhead? Because I mean, rain comes through, sun comes through. What's the purpose? I said, because it, it, it's a feeling of enclosure. You feel like this is now an outside room because you have this ceiling and it does cut down some on the hot sunlight. I grow annual vines on it, by the way, in the summer to create more shade. But looking out that window, what it is that you might want to see. I mentioned that I want to see my hummingbird feeders. I want to see the light coming through on the pieces of glass that I put on that windowsill. Um, I put my favorite containers right out that window so I can look at them. So even if you don't have a big yard, you know, that may be the place you want to look at your container plants right there. It's whatever is yours, little vignettes. It doesn't mean that you need a big view, right? That's a very pleasing composition of woody plants, even with no flowers. Look at how beautiful all the interest that's in that particular composition of shape and texture and color. Uh, it may be something like this. If you need the fence to block the view of the neighbor's cars next door, 
But look at the wonderful blues here to complement the hydrangeas. This hydrangea society meeting, by the way, in Memphis. And if you're um, you're crazy not to go on these hydrangea society tours because you'll get all kind of great ideas. Not to mention, if you're a hydrangeophile, you'll learn which ones you want to grow, and uh, they're they're fabulous. Another little vignette, just a composition of woody plants. Remember, looking through shade out into light allows you to enjoy the beauty of nature more. And here's why. If you step out into the sunlight, if sunlight's right over, just like you put a cap on so you can see better, um, you can see color and detail if there is shade, if you're looking through shade, because the pupils of your eyes actually open wider. If you step out in the sunlight, you're looking out right into bright sunlight, they shut down. So you're not gonna see as clearly, it's the same principle. So I love to put some shade over my major views and then everything out there past that will be enhanced. Now, this is a compromise because some people say, well, I do care about the view from the street. You can do both. I thought this was pretty cool. Imagine if you're in that house, you're looking out at a very interesting composition. It's not a boring row of anything. But if you're going down the street, it's also a very interesting composition. So if you just back that up a little bit and give a little space between you and the street, you can certainly design for both. So that was very smart. Again, I'm not smart enough to think of it on my own. I have to see it and go, duh. Um, let's talk about asymmetrical balance because we've talked about all the problems with trying to do mirror image um, symmetrical landscapes, how difficult that is. Mother Nature is going to fight you. But look at the balance here we've got but nothing in there is really essential. If something in there dies, we can replace it. So asymmetrical balance. Here we've got something very symmetrical and formal with that moon gate. But note, as we go toward the moon gate, the plantings on either side, they are not symmetrical. They are asymmetrical, very forgiving. We know this with, um, if you do any kind of floral design, the Ikebon type, is that the right word? Ikebon's an eggplant, something like that, Ikebana. You, you know, the height and length of that Ikebana base at the top left is balanced by the weightier, more colorful part of the side on the right. So we're looking at asymmetrical balance, asymmetrical balance, asymmetrical balance. Now, let's talk about a little bit of a sense of order. I already mentioned that I feel like we need a little bit. This is too wild and hairy. I, I don't care for this. There's some great plants in there. But not only do I want to see a little bit more order, but I don't want to go out there. Y'all, I've already had Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I was bitten by a copperhead uh, the year after I moved into my house down in the woods. But um, I, I, I'm, I need something. But I don't want that either. I mean, it looks pretty kind of cool for a minute. I certainly don't want the maintenance, but I find it pretty boring over any kind of amount of time. But here, I've got a little bit of both, right? Got a little formality. I've got some repetition. I wouldn't be ruined if something in here died. And I also feel like I could walk around my garden without fear of uh, losing blood. Now, when I talk about mixing up plants, I don't mean one of these, one of those, or one of these, one of those, one of that. We don't want to do this because, again, we're right back in the same problem should one of these die. Now, granted, you could find the firepower in Andean anywhere, but the right boxwood, probably not. So I'm going to do something very offensive right now, and I'm going to sing this landscape. I'm not a great singer, but this is not a great song. If I were to sing this landscape, it would sound like, dan, 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 you want me to stop, don't you? And I don't want to look at that. I don't want to hear it. I don't, I don't want to roll with soup cans on my wall. I don't want to hear a, a little simple rhyme like London Bridge is falling down, nor do I want to hear a wild cacophony of jazz where they lost the melody line entirely. You know, I'm going to turn both of those off. That That is not pleasing at all to me. I don't want to look at a row of Andy Warhol soup cans. I don't care how much that painting is worth. I don't want to look at that Pollock on the bottom right. Those are akin to that very unstructured wild garden that had no structure or the overly structured garden that's boring and repetitive. Let's think about paintings that we like. With some formal geometric structures, we've got some flat plane there, don't we? Which could be your lawn. And then we have some wonderful asymmetrical and naturalistic forms. So if we think that principle in mind, it's really hard to make a mistake in design, isn't it? So look here what's happening in the wild. We've got some repetition of the same forms. If 
by those trees that are there. And in the background, we got our flat plain of pond. We got some wonderfully random clouds and mountain ranges in the background. So this is a much more relaxing and forgiving. And if we think about, I like to think about the turf grass or whatever floor you may choose um, as water. And I like that water to either be a pool in my landscape that my beds take place around or a moving body of water that moves through my landscape and my beds take place around that moving body of water. And the turf allows me a way to get around the landscape. It's my highway. So that may help you with laying out some design. People say use heavy hoses. I, I, that wears me out. I drag hoses around, I'm done for the day. I use some little thin uh, nylon yellow rope you can get at the box stores. You can get a couple hundred feet for just a few bucks and kick it around till you get your lines right and draw your lines on the ground and then cut your bed shapes. I promise you, if you do that and just mulch those beds, you'll look landscape before you put in the first plant. Then I like to just take some stakes that I can write on and I'll put the names of plants on there and I'll stick them in the ground where I think they might go and I'll make some adjustments and then I go shop. So that's a very easy way. You don't need to sit down and draw a big long plan. All those hours you could be out planting. Plus you make make mistakes on paper that you wouldn't if you were actually in the landscape. Are there times for drawing a landscape? There are. If you're in the business and you want to present this fantastic plan to your customer, then yes, you want to draw one. If you're having a landscape contractor install it, then yes, you want to draw one. So let's look at going back again, paintings with some strong structural elements and some wild, wonderful flowing elements, and then how that might relate to a landscape that you see uh, here and there. So I'm just going to toggle back and forth a little bit here. Watch this river of turf where, you know, here we have a body of water that moves us through um, the river of turf with some structure in it. You know, we've got a little destination going on here. Structure is very important to me in the garden. I realized this when I first started doing uh, garden photography, that my favorite photographs always had a bit of structure in them because it seems to offset the wildness and the random, randomness that uh, plants may have. So this beautiful meadow garden up in Minnesota uh, is beautiful with or without the structure, but the structure makes it better. It just does. Here at the uh, Ripley landscape, my friends, the Walkers, who have a 167 different Japanese maples in their landscape. It's pretty wild and wonderful little, almost like a woodland of Japanese maples. But look at the strong structural elements. You can wander around, it doesn't feel like a collection at all. Can the lines be straight? Yes. But notice these straight lines at the stone ciphers. This was one of the Hydrangea Society um, tours. But the soft and spilling plants over the edge. So again, some geometry, some softing. Your vegetable, vegetable garden might be your structural element. You know, these days we don't do so much of that old plowed garden in the ground we used to plow with our tractor or our mule. So it could certainly be the structural elements. Or if it is in the ground, it could still simply, it could still be a wonderfully uh, formal geometric element. Beautiful, beautiful vegetable gardens in the world. If you, if you haven't looked up a woman called Rosalind Creasy, this is not her garden. This is actually Joe Eck and Wayne Winter Roads, but Rosalind Creasy puts her baseball garden in her front yard every year and the neighbors can't wait because she does such amazing things. <clears throat> so here's mine. Um, you remember that's my wild valley. And now I have an alley of crepe myrtles that takes me down to the raised bed vegetable garden, which I'm gonna have to fence in even with all my rescue dogs, uh, the rabbits, believe it or not. They ate my collards up this, this fall. So that's my little bit of a formal element in my raised beds, uh, which I can sit on the edge and weed and pick. Uh, gardens can be less grand. This is, uh, and if you haven't, go to the Cooper Young Garden Walk. Cooper Young Garden Walk, a lot of y'all probably know of, but you'll get great ideas on elements of how to put vegetable gardens and different ways of structuring your small garden um, in ways that serve your needs. Line can be a very strong and wonderful element. Look at how landscaped this looks, but it's about the line. It's a good line for the size of the property. It's smart because it's not trying to make turf grass grow up all the way to those tree trunks where it does not want to grow. It moves you through that landscape. The curves are exciting, but not too contrived and busy, nor are they so lazy that they're boring. 
If that were just mulch, this would look landscape. So don't underestimate the power of line. Line can be the way the grass moves, the strong geometric forms of the plants that you use. All right, so you're looking out that window and you're starting to think about some of these things. And I would say, kind of think about the backdrop before you start uh, putting plants out there or thinking about design. <clears throat> if there are buildings in the backdrop, they may be buildings you enjoy, they may be buildings you don't wanna see anymore. <clears throat> but if it's say a beautiful gray brick, it might look really good with some red foliage against it. So your bigger backdrop needs to be considered before you start thinking about what you're gonna put against it. Think about silhouettes. You may have heard this and I love this thought. Um, your garden should look good even if photographed in black and white. Shape is part of your design, spiky against mounded against pyramidal, um, divided in the garden rooms for more interest because you're gonna be intrigued. You're gonna go around and see what's in that part of the yard and what's this part. It can make a small yard even feel larger. And composing vignettes as you go through that garden from the view of the person that's moving through the garden, what's gonna look good together. <clears throat> so maybe you, when I do this talk in Knoxville, this is uh, my friend Hella Peterson's view of the Smoky Mountains. You sure wouldn't want to obscure that, but imposing some strong geometric forms against it, perfectly acceptable. In Memphis at uh, Liz Manjones landscape, she has an evergreen mixed screen to hide the house behind her and then use that as the backdrop for her variegated plants. She likes variegated plants so that they pop against that dark green background. Let's talk just a little bit more about how we put plants together because if we like to try and who doesn't, well, I guess people who don't garden don't like to try new plants, but all of us uh, that garden probably pretty much like shopping maybe as much as we do gardening uh, and how we can go out there and try new stuff all the time, experiment with new things and not have a garden that just looks haphazard and messy. So that's the fun part. So we start learning to put certain plants together for contrast or color Echoes is kind of the hit, uh, hip term for repeating as you see the, the lily here, the day lily echoes the colors in that, um, that oh shoot, yarrow, and then that dark sedum setting all that off. So let's look at some mistakes that in my eye, why would you want to put a red maple against red brick? It kind of disappears. That, that, that would be the wrong, I would rather have a bright green maple there. If it were a gray brick house, it would be entirely different. <clears throat> so when I look out at the landscape and I think about composing plants together, and I want maybe spiky, pyramidal, grassy, a little bit of structural element, something to focus on the eye, the gazing ball. This is something I put together for my veterinarian in Lexington, Tennessee. He has since moved, uh, retired and moved back to Collierville. But um, this hides the house he could see um, just past his garden pond. So he had put in the Lelands, they were starting to have some problems. So I said, well, let me put you something wonderful back there if something dies, it won't, be mat won't matter. And you can see it's mostly evergreens and it's fun to look at year round and you don't see the house back there. This thing called now small scale, when you get to put together your annuals and perennials and the smaller plants, you're not gonna really appreciate this if it's way out there in the landscape. So this stuff should probably be brought up closer to where you live. When you step out the door, when you step out on the patio, these are the places you want to do this detail work. Maybe it's just about the wonderful textures here between this uh, Japanese forest grass and the ginger known as Callaway. That would be wasted if you ask me, you know, if it were way out of the perimeter of the landscape, I want that, I want to see that every time I'm walking out to the car. All right, so how do we get some discipline into our landscape and yet feel free to buy and explore and trial and, and mess up some? I used to realize that the reason we love to look at hay bales is that strong symmetry against all the wildness of nature that if we throw a hay bale in it, we can plant pretty much whatever we want. Then I was invited to speak up at the Davis Symposium and one of the other speakers was this fabulous uh, woman named Margie Rudda and it's Margie. She's from Canada and she's one of those New York um, garden designers has done things all over the world. I was so intimidated as a country girl from Mississippi, but it turned out we had the same ideas and we, we struck up a good friendship. Um, and she had much more eloquent language. So she wrote Wild by Design and what she said in there 
was impose some strong geometry and you can let mother nature plant and it'll still look good. And you might wanna do some editing. So she imposes strong geometry and then her plantings can be pretty wildly random. And it's a fabulous freeing idea. So if you want some symmetry, you want some structure, you want some repeating elements, let it be the, the non-plant parts. So let's think of some ways we could impose geometry. I always have to give her credit for that wonderful term. A flat plane of whatever your floor might be, if it's turf grass or if it's a patio, that's geometry. The strong line that moves through the landscape. The structural elements, gazebos, the um, arbors. Uh, we'll look at some other things. Empty containers are magic. I'll show you a few slides of that in just a minute. And repetition, repeating some of those elements. And they don't have to be exactly repetitive. They can just echo. Here's some ways to pose a little formality, right? We just had the pots with the matching uh, sago palms here on either side of the door. Uh, Leanne Barron's landscape in Nashville. She's got echoing pots on either side, but the rest of it is wild and free. She could replace both boxwood, right? If something happened to one of them. So it's, it's okay to risk that mirror image if it's easily replaceable. So I'm looking at my house. I want to impose some geometry. I saw this on a trip to uh, um, Chapel Hill. And I thought I like that simple, elegant to me, uh, proportional thing. And I took pictures and I brought them back to Tommy. It was the middle house building. And, and we began to think around that. And that's how I came up with this kind of thing. So th that imposes that geometry on my view. Other things that can be hay bales, although real hay bales are a lot of fun. If you have real dogs and real hay bales, they, they, they started this game themselves. I did not put that dog up there. They play king of the mountain on the real hay bales. Um, but let's look at Ozzy Johnson is a friend of mine down in uh, Marietta, Georgia. And he's a plant collector. He's been all over the world. He's introduced a lot of fantastic plants. Like if you have a Ryusin Japanese maple, that's his. So this is a crazy collection in his backyard. But look at the formal elements, the steps that go up to this figure eight of lawn and the pillars then that provide some anchorage. So it doesn't matter how wild his paintings get, it looks, it looks landscape. More hay bales, these repeating elements. So repeating elements need not be identical. And I wanna show you um, how that can be true in, by using some of the paintings of one of my very favorite artists and not just because he's from Mississippi, um, but look at these wonderful paintings of his, repeating elements in these paintings, but, but they're not identical, but they provide such a wonderful place for the eye to rest. And yet there's randomness between the structure. It's like music, right? We, we want to hear the melody, we want to recognize the rhythm, but we like some improvisation going on in there. And that's the kind of music that's really pleasing in the long run. Uh, here we see it in a, a landscape in Memphis on one of the hydrangea tours. They're repeating them. It's not a line down that sidewalk. They're just simply a group here and a group there, this wonderful golden sweet flag, which loves shade, does well in our area. The repeating elements here are these steps and the strong geometric form of that very tightly columnar tree, that European hornbeam. Um, strong geometric elements can be uh, to be found. This is an old whiskey barrel that's been kicked apart. So just setting those rings up in the landscape gives you that, well, I love circles. I don't know why, love circles in the landscape, just do. Uh, wild, crazy planting, but here it is anchored by these terraces of lawn. Joe and Wade, Wayne Winterode's house up in uh, New Hampshire. The strong line that takes you to Jason Reeves front door and that strong geometric uh, juniper that never need pruning to look like that. That's its natural growth habit. By the way, this boardwalk is another multi-purpose solution. His front yard floods and you can't get from the parking area to the front door uh, without getting your feet wet if it's raining. So the boardwalk gets you to his front door and it was the line that leads you through his front door and you enjoy the plantings as you go. Um, at some point you might, is somebody trying to signal me to have our break, is it time? Yeah, 7.30, so whenever you uh, get ready. All right, I'll finish this little bit about the formal parts and we will take our break. Okay. Yeah. Vince Dooley's, his little bridge <clears throat> is his formal element. He's got a fantastic plant collection. You may not know it, Coach Dooley, and Michael Durr, who wrote the Woody Plant Manual, are really good friends. And 
as a result, Coach Dooley loves plants, especially hydrangeas. This is his weeping walk where he would go out to cry when he would lose a football game um, under his weeping plants. Now, I think that little bridge is cute and I would not have it white though. And I'll tell you why, I, I'm dirty and outdoors is dirty. That thing would very soon have bird poop, smashed bugs, algae and moss. And I don't wanna to have to clean it and repaint it all the time. So I'm gonna choose a natural color. Um, if you have the white gingerbread house and that's what you want, I understand that. But for me, I designed everything in my house and landscape around the colors of dirt and of dog hair. Isn't that a nice gray? I love grays and, and soft browns and, and wheat colors. Those are really nice to use in the landscape. Those structural elements could be very strongly structural plants that just look formal without any help. And I love this low growing yucca. The yucca filamentosa color guard never makes a trunk. It just makes a bow. Does that not look like a bow on a package? So if your landscape starts to look a little wild, you pop a bow in there, you're like, oh, anchored. Now empty pots. If it starts looking a little wild and hairy and you got one of these or one of those, which a lot of people will tell you not to do, and I'll tell you, go right ahead with one of these or one of those, if you'll employ these imposed geometry thoughts, drop a pot in there and then suddenly everything surrounds that pot and leave it empty if you're, that's what your goal is um, because filling it up is, is gonna remove that effect of anchoring everything. And here's why it's interesting that I had, started noticing that and trying to develop some theory around it. And I ran across this poem and the famous uh, Wallace Stevens, you probably taught in high school, called Anecdote of the Jar. And it was about Tennessee. I placed a jar in Tennessee and it made the wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around, no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. And that's the important part. If you're trying to make a wild and hairy landscape look anchored, leave that wonderful empty circle and it makes everything surround it. It took dominion everywhere like nothing else in Tennessee. So an empty pot is just amazing what it can do just to sort of center that thing. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about overhead structures when I come back. So how many minutes do we need, Chris? Uh, you tell me, are you good with five, 10? You I'm good with five. I'll just okay. make a bathroom dash and come right back. All right, so let's take a five minute break and we'll right. be back uh, here in a little bit. 7.38, see y'all. 7.38, okay. See y'all. I've got 740, so I'm going to start back. <clears throat> OK, sounds good. OK, cool. All right, so other things could be um, hay bales. Uh, impose that strong geometry or overhead structures. You can build your own like Jimmy Williams did here. And that urn also probably provides some structure, doesn't it? Uh, and also the repeating elements, right, of the white and variegated plants in this particular composition. So I'm just going to show you a few other examples. Um, Overhead structures, we love them anyway. There's something we love about going through under a tunnel, maybe from the birth experience. I don't know. We want to go through and pop out on the other side. This is Susan Belt's vegetable garden on the other side of Nashville. And that actually is a fun, that's a plaster cast of her face. And she dresses her scarecrow that she prefers to call the garden goddess for different holidays, for different weather events. I can't wait when I go over to her house to run around and see how she's dressed. She built this out of saplings and a few nails. It's collapsed since then, but remember, gardens are dynamic, changing art forms, so big deal. She was thinning out some saplings anyway. This wonderful overhead structure at Joe Eck and Wayne Winter Road just went on forever, and they too were thinning some trees on their property, and those soft needles underfoot, it was magical. A very creative structure. This was at the Rose Emporium out near Austin, Texas. I was out there doing a talk and a couple of people on the, uh, in the Memphis area have done this. I know one of the guys on the hydrangea tour. Those are little terracotta pots that are wound on cables and then kind of tied together at the top with that little spray of bells. So overhead structures can be a lot of different things, a lot of fun. 
some of you may know Felder Rushing. Um, Felder was a classmate of mine back my first time at school. I was an English major and he was already in horticulture. Then I went back to school in my 30s and became a horticulturist. <clears throat> and Felder and I have been friends, I guess, since eight, since I was 18 or so. And this is his house in Jackson, not far from my sister's house in Jackson, Mississippi. And this was one of his original entrances from the street to his garden, really likes to annoy his neighbors. Then he went to this, which was a beautiful, I love the blue, I love the painted wood, um, I love paint in the garden, I'll show some of that later on, and the rusted overhead structure. And then his last incarnation of interest was a green roof, which uh, he had um, a company come in and install the steel beams to hold the weight of the screen roof. He did the rest of it out of marine plywood and flashing and then planted it up as you can see through that hole. But y'all, the real genius, and we should probably think about this more in our landscape design is how to use light in real interesting ways, backlighting certain plants, for example, which I've done some of in my garden. But this beam of light, as the sun moves overhead, then the beam, of course, shifts and if you see, this is a terrible old slide, I'm, I apologize. I need to go back over there sometime. There's a bottle tree, a blue bottle tree. And at a certain point in the day, that beam of light lights up that bottle tree and then it passes, right? So pretty fun, I, I love that idea. It was brilliant. People like to think of Felder as kind of real folksy and fun and, and kind of overly um, countryfied. He's really a genius. He, he's a very smart guy. <clears throat> Overhead structure can be plants. You know, we've all seen the big um, oaks over the big driveway to the big southern home. Most of us don't have that scale of landscape or that much time, but these are lilac chase trees. You know, it's a great big, wonderful leggy shrub for the south. It could be Japanese maples. It could be crepe myrtles. You know, this is what I'm doing down to my vegetable garden. Um, and the reason I did that is, you know how hot you get in the vegetable garden? And I'll never forget, when we entered this canopy of shade, this is my brother Barrett and his wife Anita, this was Dallas, Texas. It was 105 that day in Dallas. And we entered that tunnel, it was just oh, incredible. And I thought when I come out of my vegetable garden, I wanna walk through a shady tunnel back up to the house. And so that's what I did on mine. Um, remember that overhead structures that you pass through are called arbors. Overhead structures that you go out and hang around, sit in, are called gazebos. You know, just a little bit of architectural terminology. This is one at Cheekwood. It's quite beautiful, made out of a bodock and black locust. Aren't we having more fun than this guy? Uh, you know, we're just having a lot more. All right, let's talk about the importance of diversity when you do your plantings. Every now and then, you know, a single row of something very clipped, if you understand that you could be setting yourself up for trouble. But mostly I'm going to tell you, especially if it's an important screen, do not do this. You want to diversify that. It's going to be more interesting. It's going to forgive some plant death. It'll forgive some loss. So if we go to something like this, this is in Memphis. Mac Mansion went up next door. So notice we have some nice big evergreens as the backbone here, and they're kind of random. They're not in a straight row, and they're different species of plants. And then we use that as a backdrop for seasonal material, for things that bloom or have fall color. And look at how well it obscures the, that house next door. Something in there dies, no biggie. If those big evergreens start to get a little bit leggy at the base, you can plant some things you know, out from them as a skirt or underneath them. So it allows a lot of flexibility. And this is what the screen um, planting handout that I talked about earlier at UT Hort will tell you how to design something like this and the plants that would work for the different components of design. Here's another great screen in Memphis. They backed the wall, the fence off from the road a bit, have some turf grass. That way you don't have the easement people come along and destroy your screen, right? and then a mixture of different plant materials and, and mostly evergreen. You might want to use a few deciduous things, but I'm going with all evergreen. The fence and the stone uh, play interesting roles here too, because that little bit of structure mixed in with all that wild planting is what we need. A wonderful tapestry screen here. Don't, don't worry if they touch and mingle. That's what they're supposed to do. That's why we call them tapestry screens. They're supposed to uh, get all up in each other. When a lot of people get all crazy when their shrubs touch, I don't know what that's about. Oh, honey, the shrubs are touching. Get out the shears, quick. 
I'm going to talk about a few landscape solutions now that look fantastic, but are actually imposed on the landscape to solve a problem. This is Ann Hensley's uh, house, friend of mine in Oak Ridge, and you can see that little shed, uh, that little offset greenhouse up there um, at the side of her house goes down to a little bit of a patio and water garden. And the poured concrete patio was starting to wash. It had a slope of turf grass all the way up to it, and there were some erosion issues. And that concrete pad was going to collapse at some point. So she got this um, stone stack going on in there, made a rock garden by layering in these stones. And you're probably seeing a lot of this now uh, with crevice gardening, we're calling it. Crevice gardening going on. If you haven't looked, looked online and Google up crevice garden and see what's going on. Stop the erosion, made her a rock garden place to try all those plants that really like good drainage and don't particularly like being in our, our wet uh, Tennessee soil throughout the winter months. And it's beautiful. So a solution that turned out to be a great landscape at, at, uh, asset. Um, I think I already talked about looking out from the window, so I'm not going to go there too much. And that line should have been in the other. Oh, different ways to impose line as part of strong geometry. That's what this little part is about. <clears throat> Can be the bed edging, you know, beautiful shapes. There's your strong line. There's your geometry. At Cheekwood, they deliberately just have these really are somewhat functional in that they may step down that slope a little bit and help prevent erosion. But it's mainly about pulling your eye across that landscape, that strong line. Here, the little road that Joe Eck and Wayne Winter Road drive their little truck across, you know, the bridge I showed you earlier, because their vegetable garden is out back there. It's the only sunny part of their property. So they like to drive their little pickup truck up there with straw um, and manure and, and take care of their garden. And it's just wide enough for them to either walk up there together or to drive their little truck up there together. Jason's boardwalk I already discussed. This line, when I talk about turf grass being a river that pulls you through the landscape, that makes a great line that carries you back to um, into Cromboats's little potting shed that she also does garden sculpture in. A straight line, we already mentioned that. Jimmy, Jimmy Williams, who's 84, 85 maybe, and has been writing a gardening column for the Paris Intelligencer, if you want to look him up now for about 50 years, as did his grandmother before him. Every bit of this landscape, Jimmy's hands. Little wiry guy, funny as heck. He loves to wear that t-shirt when the preacher's coming over. But look at the line, the way that pulls you through his landscape, the turf grass and the edges between the turf grass and the beds. The walks can be the strong line that pulls you through. A lot of different ways to do walks. I particularly like this one, because these are very ordinary, um, you know, garden products you can go buy at any big box stores, but they were just used a little more specially. This guy was 86 too, by the way. He was six foot six when I met him. I'm sure he's gone now. This is an old slide I scanned. I looked up at him and I said, how tall were you before you started shrinking? But, you know, he loved his sidewalk and I love it too. Um, Good looking walk, but I don't want this walk. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I am going to be 70 next year, and you know when you break the hip, it is all over. I'm getting to the point where I don't even want to go outside unless I strap on my hip pads, right? So that is too tricky for me, y'all. Ain't going to do it. I don't drink anymore, but I might be looking at a cloud or a bird or just, you know, I'm wobbly. So no, 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 no. Looks good. Ain't going to have it. Might, maybe you could. I couldn't. A, a strong line can simply be mowed through a wild area, just a if you want to do wildflower paintings, the sun as they look a little hairy at certain times of the year, just mow you some strong line through them. Also, voila, they look landscaped. Paths can be a lot of different materials. I'm fond of gravel because it's so easy. I mean, shoving gravel is not easy, but you know, you don't have to worry about leveling the ground and a base of sand and getting all the bricks just so and the stones just so. You make them skinnier when you want to, and you can make them wider where you want to. Now remember, the gravel needs to suit the slope. Um, if it's flat, you can use very finely crushed gravel, which is my favorite, but if it's not- Remember a the time she had that horrible cough? Who went and got the cough medicine? Hello? Anyway, I just- Hello? Somebody's not muted. Hello? Who has a horrible cough? Hmm. 
Oh, well. Um, if you have a slope, you're going to need to use a coarser gravel or terrace the gravel on down. But I'm very, very fond of gravel. There's a lot of ugly gravel in the world. I don't want, you know, white marble. I don't want red lava rock. But you can go to the places that sell gravel and walk around and look at the piles, the colors, the textures. I'm not a fan of the washed river rock with the smooth edges because it's always moving around just like it does on country roads down in Mississippi. But crushed rock, chert up here, you know, uh, was a, a revelation to me because it packs down, it gets hard, you know, it's, it's good stuff. And so I like, I prefer crushed stone for my gravel paths because they do pack down. I can push a wheelbarrow over them. And maybe one day when I'm old, somebody can push me around in my wheelchair over them and the, don't end up with uh, pea gravel in my sandals. So that's my preference. Um, you can make your, 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 uh, your walk very special. And I love this. And one day I'm gonna do this. Look, it's not hard. You pick the right stones to make the straight lines on the side of the corners. And then what's left in the center, you just random. So it's more beautiful than if it were all random or if it were all square. And I love again that 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 you know geometry with asymmetry. A little bit about water because um, you know water is transformative. I mentioned that earlier. You want to see water. The human brain feels like you know life can is going to continue if we can see some water somewhere in the landscape. We love to go find water and look at it. Take the dogs to it for a drink and a swim. And I do have a little creek. This isn't my creek on my property, but it's too far for me to see from the house. So I. I did the pond thing. But let's look at some ways that you could do water without having to go through a whole lot of expense or, or maintenance. Now, if you have the deep pockets, I'm gonna give you that option too. This is at um, Gibbs Garden down in Ball, Georgia. He is a retired landscape ar architect who made a lot of money in Atlanta. Now it's a public garden. And this is fabulous. And I'm you know, not gonna begrudge anybody that gorgeous, gorgeous water garden, but you know, he's got people to maintain things too, and he, he's got the money to do it. Or you could just get inventive on your own if you want to be creative and, and are handy at um, the Plant Delights Nursery up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Tony Abent and his crew there that works at his greenhouses built this waterfall by constructing a big cove um, arbor of chicken wire and boards and then padded lightweight concrete over the whole thing and then piped water over the top into this pool. There's also a bench behind that waterfall and a path. So if you wanna sit there and look at the garden through the falling water and listen to the falling water, then you can. It, it was really brilliant and they did do it themselves. Um, I don't like to hear falling water all the time. I know some people say it's a good thing to obscure city noises. But how many times do y'all have to get up and go to the bathroom? I'm just wondering. I don't really want to hear water running all the time. And the other thing is, as soon as I'm listening to sound in the woods, I'm trying to identify a frog call or can hear a turkey gobble down in the valley. I don't want to hear water, water, water obscuring all the, the sounds of nature around my uh, very private rural home. So quiet water. I do like to see moving water. And you've seen these where the water just slips quietly over the top, top of the pot or at the Cooper Young Garden Walk, isn't this brilliant? Just a, a clear acrylic tube sliding down through that sea glass and then piped back up to the top and always pouring down those edges. So there's a lot of different things you can do with water that aren't gonna be very expensive. Some people are worried about having a pool in the landscape. Some think it's gonna attract snakes, which I was bitten on a dry path. My niece was bitten out by the mailbox and the gravel. So that's not true, number one. But number two, if you're just nervous and you think there's gonna be a snake in there or you don't want anything to have the potential to fall in and, and drown, Tom Pellet did this beautiful uh, bubbling water garden in Memphis. And uh, you can see how it just kind of spirals on out and out into the woods. If I love anything more than circles, it might be spirals, but that's awesome. And then the stone cypress did something very similar very cooling little area, part of their garden to sit and listen to the water play on the rocks. And, you know, water and stone makes the stone so much more colorful. But remember, if you do want a water garden, it doesn't have to be that very typical lima bean shape with the waterfall of rocks. We got a garden guy here in town who does a good job with water gardens, but to me, they always look the same. They can be square. You can walk over the water on the pillars if you want to. 
So it doesn't have to be all the same, get, get, get creative. Um, having just a little bit of water can be transformative. And this is Susan Phelps, big, she's a potter. So this was a big pot she threw, but you can find a big pot somewhere. Got to get some bling from uh, a hobby store and put the big stones in there because a lot of things can drown in a pool of water. You know, you've probably found blue-tailed skinks. You've probably found um, toads that couldn't get out and have drowned. You know, friends have found worse, like puppies. So put something in the water so little things can come out. Always, always, always think about safety. A pot without a hole can be a water garden. Faye Beck did this one. Uh, at her place in Oak Ridge. And a flea market finds if you just want a bird bath, see how that reflects the trees above. It doesn't have to be your typical, you know, roadside concrete store bird bath, bird bath. It can be some found objects at flea markets and such. So just putting that water out there, if it's just a galvanized tub at Garden Zoe Bay, I can afford that water garden. I can do that maintenance. Her little vignette there with that simple chair and then that umbrella magnolia. Um, it was just genius. Very simple vignette, but quite effective. Whereas, I'm so disappointed. If I had that much money to have that as my water garden, do, does a Greek statue fit your style? I'm just wondering. Maybe it does. Maybe you, you know, live in a big Greek revival home, and it does but not me, and I didn't really enjoy looking at the Greek head once, much less twice in the reflecting pool, and I'm petty. I am. I'm small-minded. I enjoyed the fact that birds have been perching on that head and doing what birds do, and look at how boring the planting is. Dit, dot, dit, dot, dit, dot, dit, dot. Oh, give me that money. I could have done something so much fun. While we're on water, I'm going to hit a few more things. Love an outdoor shower. Who doesn't? We often just see them at the vacation homes and we're like, wow, you can do one at your own house. My friends are the caches in Austin, Texas, and they're very conscious about water use there, right? So the gray water runs off and waters their landscape. Um, all it is is some four by fours and some corrugated tin. That door goes right into their bathroom. So in you know bad weather, they shower inside. Good weather, they step right out here and shower and water their plants at the same time. And it's fabulous. Outdoor showers, a lot of different ways you can do outdoor stuff. You know, just, just let your imagination roam. This is the back porch of one of the houses at Cooper Young. They put a clawfoot tub out there and they got these doorknobs for hanging their towels and such on. So, you know, it's just pretty cool and fun. While we're talking about water, we gotta talk about moving water away from the house. Now, everybody thinks they need gutters. And I decided when I built my house, I did not want gutters. I grew up in a house built in 1914, big wooden two-story, kind of a country plain Victorian that's just as sound as a dollar because it's up on brick stanchions and it drains well away from the house. So this, I, all I hear about gutters are bad. Gutters are expensive, gutter installation, gutters get full of leaves, uh, gutters get torn off by limbs falling, things die in gutters and stink. Gutter, 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 gutter. Grew up without gutter. I decided it's all a scam. And so I was visiting, as I mentioned, Chapel Hill and this Japanese tea house. This caught the water coming off the roof in the gravel and then it moved out into the landscape. And that's what I'm doing. So I did. I just put plain old crushed gravel. I couldn't afford this washed rock around my house. And it catches the water off the roof slows it before it hits the turf grass. It moves slowly to the turf, through the turf grass, down the slopes. It hits a berm that I put around the perimeter of my lawn that guides all that water to my pond because my pond doesn't really have quite enough uh, watershed to keep it full year round. So I caught water and moved it that way. It looks like I know what I'm doing, y'all. I mean, my daddy was a road engineer, so maybe some of that rubbed off. But you know, you do need to think about water um, I just don't believe in this idea that rainwater is bad, that you catch it in a gutter, you put it in a drain spout, you shove it underground, you dump it out on the street or in those underground drains, and then it collects more and more water as it goes through the city until somebody downstream is getting uh, flooded 
That's us. We're, and we're supposed to let water move through the soil and cleanse itself and replenish our aquifers and our streams and lakes. Our streams and lakes are supposed to be 60% fed by groundwater, but we're sending it all downstream before it can. So anyway, I decided no gutters and I've really been thrilled. But remember the days when we loved to play with rainwater? Mama let you go out in your swimming suit after a rainstorm. Water is beautiful. So I love these sort of chains that catch that water off that, off that gutter if you want to have a gutter so that you can walk in and out the door without getting wet. I'm all for that. And every, each one feels it cascades over and you see the play of the water. It's gorgeous stuff. Chains can direct it that way. Why not keep some of that rainwater on site for your birds or your pets? I love rainwater. If it does have to go down into a drain, make the drain fun. You know, can be interesting. The stone ciphers impose this um, rock uh, riprap to stop the erosion. They had put a grassy swale to move the water away from their two big homes out there. And the riprap was a, a cure for some erosion that started in. But look, just for the heck of it, they imposed these three little waterfalls and they got grandkids. So when it has a big rain event, you got three waterfalls for, you know, a couple hours in the yard. Uh, how fun is that? Uh, some of these garden tours, again, in Memphis, look at the ways that they chose to move water out of the flower bed, slow it down through these rocks and, and direct it to parts of the yard. Now, a lot of times we put this water into the rain gardens deliberately that are meant to stop, hold the water in our yard and let it percolate on down through that soil. It's very important. All of us should consider that for our own place. So just different solutions on moving water and, uh, around the landscape. All right, outdoor living, and we'll start wrapping it up here. Um, you know, I felt like P. Allen Smith felt like he sort of invented, you know, outdoor living spaces. But of course, uh, they were, here's Jimmy's, you know, and Jimmy, I mentioned is 86. So usually I like these, I think they're most used when they're right outside your kitchen. Most of us don't sit down much. I mean, we're busy, we're puttering, we got stuff to do. So you might sit down for a minute when you get that sandwich or that cup of tea, or you have a friend over, uh, might want to eat out there. And so close to the kitchen, I'm always saying, you're going to use that space a whole lot more if it's close to your kitchen. Um, my friends K.O. and Helen Mullen were married, had big families, their spouses died, and they remarried each other I mean, after their spouses died in their 70s. And they've had a great uh, gardening relationship. They're some of our favorite master gardeners here. You can imagine the size of those joined families because both of them already had a lot of kids. So they built this wonderful big deck right outside their kitchen so they can overflow out there when they're entertaining family. It's also where we have a lot of our master gardener events um, because they do our leaf casting uh, classes over there. They're very talented at that. And they have a hydrangea collection of over 100 cultivars that we get to go tour. But you didn't have to be a big one here at Cooper Young. Let's look at how they threw together this little deck out there. What are they? They're pallets. What are the chairs made of? They're pallets. Look over there at the storage shelves and the, the grill area, pallets. What is the sofa on the front porch and the table next to it? Pallets. So I love all this inventiveness and this recycling and, and, you know, scaling things down to your budget. What can you afford? You can probably afford some pallets and a few nails and a hammer to put some things together. It's serving the same purposes. I'm like that about my clothes. You know, I don't spend a lot of money on clothes. I, I, I'm warm. You no. Know, so we showed that one already. Uh, some of the Cooper Young people built little outdoor rooms on, and you can see here how simple the construction is, basically just a little barn shed, um, and screened it in and put plastic around it in the winter, but what, a, what an inviting space and just filled with little art eclectic things and flea market finds. It can just be a pair of old chairs and a table with a colorful cloth, just someplace outside that you enjoy sitting and and doing whatever you, is you like to do or sipping on whatever it is you like to sip on. Color, fun, part of the Cooper Young, they invite you in to have a lemonade, pet the dog, everybody's friendly. They all help take care of each other. It's a mixture of young people and old people in that neighborhood. And man, what a great community, they're just fabulous. This was one of the coolest things I saw at Cooper Young Garden Walk. You know, having a fire pit out there is so much fun. We love to have a fire outdoors and look at it. 
and you want to keep it contained and safe. So you know, here they did just some simple pavers to lift this fire pit up on the ground. And just look at it real closely and you'll realize it is the drum out of a washing machine. It just happened to fit that street grate that they happened to go along with it. And of course I was there during the day, so I didn't get to see what it would look like at night, but they said all the pinpricks of light that are thrown out all those through those tiny holes. Can you imagine how spectacular that is? So fire is fun, a fun element to have in the garden. Just be sure you keep it away from things that could burn. Um, and you may want to put your seating on something a little firm so that, you know, chair legs can sink and, and rock. So you might want to, to, to do that. Speaking of seating, Maybe that's okay, garden tour, to sit down for a minute and tie my shoe, but I'm not gonna sit there for long, right? Who wants to sit down on granite? Makes my butt cold just thinking about it. Uh, flea market finds, these are of course some old tables and look at what the table is. It's a piece of plate glass set up on some old sewing machine bases. So comfortable outdoor seating, things that don't show dirt, put, put them in the cool places, just, you know, Found objects, again, Cooper Young. I go crazy over spirals, so you know I like these augers. I've collected about eight cents and I'm still pondering where they're gonna go in my landscape. I've got two of them placed, but isn't that, that cool? Outdoor spaces can be big if you're gonna have big um, events or even if you decide you wanna maybe hire it out for weddings or such, there's a lot of good income in that kind of thing, but it, it doesn't have to be, it can certainly be small. Stone cypress, they use old recycled lumber and the old tin squares that used to find in uh, on ceilings in the, in the old older days. So pretty cool there. A great deck at Gardens Way Bay. And I wouldn't have thought about imposing a modern design like this out in this wonderful wild natural area, but man, it really works. Uh, so I enjoyed sitting there one day and watching the great blue hair and work the edges. And there's my favorite hosta, y'all guacamole because guacamole looks that good even in late summer, one of my very, very faves. Look at the little detail that Diane has a great eye for putting detail, the steps that step up to that deck and the little zigzag rickrack edge on it, I thought was a nice thing to leave it that way. Um, let's go back to um, going, here we got a lot of good things. We got destination. We're going through something, which is a, a hay ring, right? And I've got now, I stole this idea. This is Linda Askey's house down in Birmingham. And you're going over there to her fire pit. Now her fire pit, oh, and look at the detail, by the way, there with the, with the stone um, and the brick as you go through the, she won this by entering an online contest, this Corten steel fire pit. And she'd been buying these pieces of slag glass here and there all around the country when she traveled. And she's like, man, the light bulb went off. I stacked them around the top of that Corten fire pit. I will, of course, wasn't there in the evening again. Um, it was frosty morning, in fact, but she said, you can imagine what that looks like when you're sitting around the fire, right? All the color flickering through those pieces of glass. And so Linda, I'm going to steal your idea. One day, I will give you credit, always. She also took a chair design you can find online called the Wave Hill Chair. And it's it was originally more deep set, like an Adirondack low and that deep, steep angle. I don't know about y'all, but I can't get out of an Adirondack chair anymore unless I got help. So she took it to the local shop teacher and they raised that a little bit and made it less steep. And it's very comfortable. I sat in those chairs and look at that. We could build that. Now this, that's a pretty easy little chair. Another fire pit in Memphis, that globe. Can you imagine what the light looks like? The fire coming through there and and the seating there to sit around and uh, enjoy that. That uh, found objects, a built on back room, all the blues, because this is the Hydrangea Society, right? So you know that's their favorite color. So uh, brilliant ideas everywhere you look. If I could do, tell you to do anything to get inspiration, it's go visit other gardens. There's so many opportunities. And by the way, the Mid South Hydrangea Society is like 10 bucks a year, and they have great newsletters, great speakers, and great garden tours. Really all you need for an outdoor living area is a level spot. You can just get the grass off of it and put some gravel on it and put something around it to hold that gravel. So here a little outbuilding up at Unique Gardens uh, made a great little outdoor setting. And your end tables, do you need to go buy garden furniture? You got a tree that falls down. I could do a whole slide program on things people have come up with when the tree goes down. 
there's some very clever stuff out there, but just a simple little table to set your drink is all you need. Okay, you need entrance. Ooh, here you go. This weekend, you could do this in one afternoon. Go buy you some papers and stack them up to make some little columns and put you a nice planner on top. Voila, entrance is there. It says, this is how you come in. I'm, fences are one of the very last things I'm gonna address, so hang in with me just a minute. Why are there so many ugly fences? If you gotta look at a fence, then you should at least make it attractive or somehow make it look like it belongs there. So look, study these materials, right? Pretty simple. I'm gonna, next picture is gonna use basically, you know, same type of materials, but it's just gonna be designed better. It just feels so much better. So let's look at that. Is that not better? It may be the color, but I think it's a little bit of spacing. It's just got, you know, it's got that eye. Some people have it, you know, the eye. Or again, if you don't, then you got Pinterest. Type in Pinterest and fences and ideas for fencing. You know, and we realize that fences do have different purposes. Um, the one on the left up there, you can see it's inexpensive. You may want to completely block out that neighbor. You got your reasons. You either don't like them or they like you way too much and have to come over and comment every time you're doing something in your garden. So that may be what you want to do. The one on the right, if I ever win the lottery, I want that one. Um, and I always imagine if you were to pull one of those pieces of metal back and let go, and a ripple would just run down that whole fence line with playing music. Wouldn't that be fun if I ever have a lot of money? This is something I want to do around my vegetable garden because even with my rescue dogs who have a dog door and could go out there and protect my garden if they would, um, I'm getting damage from rabbits. I mean, I see deer, they don't come up real close to me because they know better than that. But that's a really nice fence, I think. And those are the panels you can buy at the co-op or the feed store, these fence panels. You can get all different size of grids. You know, if, you, if the grids are too big, the rabbits can go through them. If it's just dogs or something you're trying to keep out, it could be a bigger grid. Black iron has a nice look, can look a little prison-like. So I would say I always soften that kind of fence with uh, some uh, plant material. I do like the rusted metal. Got an ugly fence. People say can grow vine on it, but yeah, that you can, but vines can get a little vigorous and hard to control. I say train a weeping plant along it. This is our weeping blue atlas uh, cedar, which does well in the South, unlike most blue conifers. And uh, or a weeping yopon, you know, any weeping tree, you could train it along here instead of a vine. Using plants inventively that way, here is an alley, of, well, you know, walk under an alley of plants of oak leaf hydrangeas, which do get really large, but this was at Hella Peterson's house. Rather than cutting them back and trying to make them stay a manageable size, she took advantage of that tall growth habit, limbed them up and over. There was a little article in Fine Gardening about her this uh, a couple of years ago with them in bloom. I was in there. I was there in the winter. Weeping plants used inventively. My friend Faye Beck put this weeping uh, red bug called Traveler where it wept right over the top of her waterfall of her water garden. I thought that was a brilliant move. A little bit about art in the garden. It's all about placement and, you know, just having a good eye again for the right art and where, where you put it. I think. So like these loons that Faye put in the sea of time would not be nearly as effective if they weren't swimming in that little pond of green. Um, my a new friend I made a few years ago, I saw on a show about Tennessee artist, Sydney Reichman, um, outside of Murfreesboro. She has 35 acres and she her sculptures are about Tennessee trees. She said, that's what inspired her. She's about my age. She can't do these big sculptures anymore, but you can stay at her Airbnb and walk her 35 acres. And I wish I could afford some of her pieces. God, I love them. I just love them. And I need this sort of art, I think, for my house because my house is strange. I had to get rid of my old art didn't work there. You know, it didn't go with a rustic modern theme. This was a brilliant stroke. And I'm doing this with whatever art I think I can afford it someday. She put this sculpture on a raft in the pond and the raft is loosely tethered to the bottom of the center of the pond, which means the raft can flow around on 
different weather events depending on the direction of the wind and the breeze. So this sculpture moves around the pond and has different backgrounds all the time. And it's at the whims of nature, which I just adore that thought. Um, this would probably be a great piece of art for my house. I always wonder what my dogs would think if we're walking in the woods and we come up on this giant um, rabbit, human, hu what would you call it, a hubit, uh, a ramen? Anyway, I just think that's really cool. It's all made of pressed wire. Art, different ways of using art, having fun with head pots, you know, amuse yourself. He's a moody guy, so I'll give him horrible hairdos just to make him mad. Paint him, end up with a little bit on paint. Faye Beck took her lilac shows chase tree flowers to the paint store and said, match this. And she painted the pillar and the gazing ball to go with that uh, lilac chase tree. This, same thing with this door. You got a potting shed, got something back there. You know, carry that hydrangea. That has that paint can be used very imaginatively. I mentioned Felder Rushing's blue decks. As you walk around his front yard, there's no turf grass, just stacked blue decks. Um, this is a very expensive sculpture at Chanticleer and put that on your bucket list. If you're going to Philadelphia, you want to go to Longwood, but if you can only go to one garden, go to Chanticleer. Uh, it is the, my favorite garden probably in the country. But these are uh, fragile, ceramic, expensive sculptures by Marcia Donahue. But here we go, Tennessee style. They just I copied the idea using some bamboo, painted them different colors, dropped them in a pot. So come on, windstorm, not out anything if something gets broken there, right? But you got the same effect. Paint. <laughs> I'm winding up now. If you've ever been asked to pet sit some of your neighbors when they're out of town and they happen to have some pampas grass, this might be a fun thing to do to celebrate Mardi Gras, say just to see if they have a sense of humor. You know, they don't like it. You know, the, the grass plumes can always be cut down. You know, you would think these people were tripping, right? This was in the Smoky Mountains I ran across this, but no, it was an inspiration from a higher power, apparently. All right, I'm gonna close with a thought, and that is, as you design your landscape, we've got to think about the fact that um, we have crowded out a lot of wildlife and we our insect populations are plummeting. And we need to realize we need, we need them. As Jane Goodall says, um, we are a species that is able to recognize the, that we need these other elements that, you know, we'll die without insects, without them to do the work of pollinating. It isn't just about the food we eat, it's about the air we breathe. Uh, and it's one reason I like dogs. They, they, they return me to that moment of wild and put me back into communion with nature. They're, uh, the communication is so pure, but it, 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 it centers me. And I know a lot of us through this pandemic have felt like that being out, you know, that nature does heal. But so I, I like this quote, I had to steal it from a book called The Wolf, The Woman, The Wilderness. And she said, um, if I can't live in the wilderness, I can let some wilderness live with me. Uh, she also said that she left the spiders in the, in the ceiling over her bed because she liked the idea of a skillful predator living just overhead. Some people wouldn't like that, but I thought that's pretty cool. In fact, I thought that's the best excuse for poor housekeeping I've ever heard. And I'm gonna steal that thought, that's pretty profound. So do whatever it is that pleases you. You know, this is my house, it makes me happy. If I can say anything, I would say do something because the only thing I regret about buying this ragged hundred acres and building this house and putting myself back in debt at this age is I wish I'd done it sooner. So don't delay, just do it. Go out there, man, think about that. If you're sitting out there a year or two from now, just enjoy it thinking, why didn't I, why have I waited so long to enjoy this? So I hope that um, helps you to think about uh, some ideas that got rid of some ideas that you might've had and uh, just the last, I promise the very last slide, it could be just something this simple you want to do this weekend that just makes you smile, okay? And uh, with that, I'll close and I will ask if you have any questions. <laughs>